Welcome to Psywar. We are the official podcast of the Psychological Operations Regiment. Is there anything you'd like to add to that or anything that you've seen that might be, you know, a little bit different or anything else? Yeah, so I've worked, so I was originally, it's a 349 in Denver, Colorado. And then um, as a training NCO, I worked with the 316th in Indiana. And like I said, now I'm currently in a training unit. So I've seen a lot of different aspects of how it works to train up soldiers and Luckily, as an AGR, I was in charge of kind of helping my ops NCO come up with our yearly plan of, okay, this is how we're going to attack this. This is how we're going to best train our soldiers. And what that kind of looks like is, you know, making sure they qualify their weapons twice a year. We were fortunate enough to be on a base where we could shoot anywhere from three to five times a year in practice or shooting that way. Uh, We set up different six lanes twice a year where we would set up different lanes for our teams to run through so that we could grade them. So in a condensed version of how this works is you can have your battalions come down and check off your detachments to say they're good to go on certain things, but the commander and the first sergeant can kind of set go on your teams. And it's a little different. Your whole detachment would go to a CTC to get graded that way. But you only have a finite amount of time to do all of your training as a PSYOP soldier. So you're going to go through your basic PSYOP seven phases. You're going to go through your basic um, target audience analysis, integration, integration to the companies you're attaching on to, and integration in, you know, into a village that you're wanting to connect with. That's something we talk about a lot. I like to go over like different types of communication because that's our biggest, you know, takeaway is being able to talk to different kinds of people and address our points and understanding in different cultures. Like I'm not as a female gonna necessarily take lead if I'm the team leader, I have to know when to step back and I have to have my assistant, you know, team leader able to step forward and take the reins for me. So, and you have to understand that our units change so much. You have to be able to do this with different people in your team. So as close as your team and your detachment gets, there's gonna be somebody that at the last minute, they're not gonna be there. So you have to be able to prep this other person to take their place and be able to complete the mission in a short amount of time. So there's a lot of different aspects with the Army Reserve PSYOP soldier, there's a lot more, I think, that's expected of us because we're not only trying to learn PSYOP in itself, but doing our basic soldiering skills and then getting all of our admin tests done in addition to. Yeah. Yeah. It seems as if you guys definitely need to be extremely resilient and flexible um, and, and, you know, be able to adapt your, your lifestyle very quickly to, to meet the demands of what is required. Um, the next thing I, I got a question about is what school opportunities exist um, as a SOB soldier in the reserve component? Like if you wanted to go to, let's say, a military deception course or any other, you know, maybe a tactical IO planner course or anything that's in the wheelhouse of SOP or IO, are those available to reserve soldiers? Absolutely. I was able to send uh, my soldiers to Mildec, IO. Uh, One of the great things about being in the reserves um, as a SOP soldier is that we are able to get battle staff, which is not available to a lot of other job fields. We are able to, especially for soldiers that are thinking about state going from active duty to the reserves that weren't in psychological operations before, we do get some airborne slots. Sometimes we can get mountain slots. I sent, uh, I think I sent eight soldiers to air assault one year. There's just, 
depending on what you want, if you're really pushing for certain schools or want your career paths to go a certain way, then that's totally available. We also have language school slots and there are other ways to go to like a condensed 12 week school at a college that we can send you to, to get language training that doesn't require um, the D-Lab. Excuse me, okay. yeah, it doesn't require right, the fine. D-Lab to go to like the 12 week schools. So, so it, that's is kind there, of- Is there like a cap on how many days a year that you can be on, I guess, like a, an active duty position it, it, or it be activated? Is that what it's considered in? U.S. Army Reserve when you're, say, TDY for 45 days at a school or deployed for six months? Um, is there a cap so not, on how many days a year you can do that? Not for a deployment. If you're on deployment, that's a completely different set of orders. <clears throat> okay. But if you're going to schools, your school's not generally going to be more than 29 days. And if you're looking to do more hours than your 29 days for schools or what have you, then it is possible to extend those orders. It's a whole different set of orders to do that. But again, with juggling civilian life and family or whatever you have going on, you know, the 29 days is generally going to be enough for anybody. And schools like IO and MILDEC, those are shorter. You're talking like one or two weeks for those. Okay. So Jacob, I got a question for you. Um, Coming over from active duty to U.S. Army Reserve, what were your changes in your quality of life? What did that look like? And um, what are you able to do now in the U.S. Army Reserve that you weren't able to do in the active duty uh, component? Yeah, so um, quality of life, you know, obviously you're, you know, civilian soldier. So what comes first, you you know, you're, you're civilian, but you're also a soldier. You're still living the army values and, uh, you know, conducting yourself accordingly, keeping yourself in shape and, and all of that. So, uh, you know, having a civilian job is, is obviously there are its, um, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there are things that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, places and training exercises that I didn't even know existed while I was active duty. Uh, Fort Hunter Liggett had never heard of it while I was active duty, was able to go support uh, AIT and uh, support the the incoming uh, PSYOP Reserve Soldier component uh, training, whereas active duty, I had no idea that it even existed, didn't even know where Fort Hunter Liggett was. It's in California. It's beautiful. Um, And, you know, Operation Cold Steel, never heard of it while I was active duty, was able to participate in that as well. Really great uh, training exercise for the reserve component. So um, additionally, you know, as far as um, security clearance, I have a higher security clearance now as a civilian than I did when I was active duty. So whereas, you know, you're might be limited in active duty as far as what you can do as far as your security clearance as a civilian soldier you have basically two careers and you can advance yourself in that realm as well if you enjoyed this clip listen to the whole episode by using your favorite podcast streaming service